Hi, I'm Tom Long, and I was going to do this introduction standing outside in front of my little 13-foot uh, whaler, but uh, today the neighbors decided it was a good day to do some construction work, and so we're going to be inside. But I did take the little whaler out for a cruise yesterday and went down the uh, Cape Fear River into Southport and then hooked around on the intercoastal waterway and went up through the uh, Yacht Harbor. So I hope you'll enjoy that footage and watch it closely because I had a surprise visitor who made quite a splash. <laughs> this is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost and in our passage today from Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, Paul concludes the first section of that letter with a prayer. And at the end of that prayer is a benediction that is probably the most used, most famous, and therefore most familiar benediction in, in all of the Bible. And today we're gonna to look at the context in which that benediction occurs. If you were writing a prayer for your church, which was dealing with some divisive issues, how would your prayer go? Paul begins his prayer by telling us his posture for prayer. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, he writes. Do you kneel when you pray? <laughs> I can't, but according to the Bible, I will. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul wrote that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And going back even further in time, in Isaiah 45, 23, the prophet tells us the words that God spoke to him. By myself I have sworn, my mouth is uttered in all integrity, a word that will not be revoked. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. Now, bowing the knee is a way of recognizing the sovereign majesty of God. Paul's prayer continues, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So in verse 14, he says that he bows, uh, he kneels, bows his knee before the Father, and the word for Father there is patera. And then in verse 15, he says that from whom every family, and that word is patria, so you can see there's a connection between the word for father and for family that's translated family here in the NIV. But patria can really mean any clan, ethnic group, community, or even a country. In fact, the French national anthem, La Marseillaise, begins with, Allons enfants de la patria. Come children of the fatherland. So they're using, you can see that it's a Latin language, right? Uh, well, there we have a Greek word <laughs> that is shared with the Latin, which is patria. And Paul is slyly making the point that all families, all groups, all countries have one father in God. He's above them all. And that's Paul's first salvo in his prayer for unity. So now we know that he's praying to the father who is no matter what country we're from, what ethnic group we're from, what family we belong to, even if the two families are feuding, we're all praying to the Father that is our Father. Now, we come to Paul's first petition in verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Now, given that God has glorious wealth in terms of power, there's more than enough of that power to share. Our weakness is made strong with God's power. As the Holy Spirit works on us from the inside out, then Paul's next petition suggests what we might need the Spirit's power for. Beginning in verse 17, he writes, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul moves here from the Father and Holy Spirit to the Son, the Christ God sent to us out of his love for the world. He prays that Christ might move into our hearts and dwell there, a connection that happens through faith. But Paul quickly returns to the primacy of love. He prays that the church will be, quote, rooted and established, unquote, in love. We're like a plant that receives both its support and its nourishment through roots dug deeply and firmly into the soil of love. And the word established refers to the way the earth was prepared back then to support a structure. We build our lives on, our lives are established on the firm foundation of love. That way, you and I and all the Lord's holy people can have the power to grasp, to hold on to, something our mortal minds can't fully wrap themselves around. We can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and, quote, know this love that surpasses knowledge, unquote. The self-proclaimed super apostles boasted that their special revelations and knowledge made them superior to Paul and the other Ephesians in the church. Paul says that if we can only grasp how much greater, how much more important love is, we can be the united family of God that we are meant to be. To know, to experience this kind of love is to be, quote, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, unquote. And now here at the end, we come to that wonderful doxology as Paul wraps up his prayer. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I bet you've heard that one before if you're a churchgoer. God the Father empowers us with God the Holy Spirit to build on, to grasp Christ's love for us. A love that is, to translate this more literally, hyper abundantly more than anything we can ask for because we can't even imagine how great that love really is and how that love is for every one of us. This empowering, overabundantly loving God deserves glory, not just from the church in Ephesus a couple of thousand years ago, but in our churches today and among believers for all the generations that might come to pass before Christ's return. And after that, after that, God deserves glory forever and ever. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Oh,